perhaps similar to anywhere in the world, but what do you think has led to the, the general um, abandonment of fields and the apathy and the negativity that associated with the farming? Long-term programming of people, like uh, children as such don't grow up nowadays to be farmers because parents who grew, through, grew up themselves through an era of hardship where it was like a survival farming was mostly what was happening. It was very hard for these parents to see the value of raising their children into another cycle of this. Okay. So the advice of parents to all the children was to become doctors, to become engineers. It's not a negative voice I'm saying, uh, saying it with, because of course everybody wants their children to have a better life. To be better than them. And better. Yes, yes. But again, it's also government programming as well, like to get the people away from the fields into factories, into high-end jobs, to boost the economy. Uh, so it was kind of like a mantra that was uh, voiced out to the people. And it's the same even from Ireland where I grew up in. Like my mother's generation and before were all agri agrarian people for the most part. And they all left the lands to go become uh, factory workers or builders or doctors or engineers, you know. So the same things happened. But now, of course, we've, we've come to a, a time where there is high-value vegetables, there is high-value fruits, there is high-value farming. And Why is that? Because there's so much low-value stuff going on. Like in the West, you can go to Tesco's or Aldi's and you can buy tomatoes for 50 rupees the, the kilo, let's say, because people are doing large-scale production without taste and flavor, let's say, to be simple, and people remember what good things taste like. So like this, we're doing like, we do about a thousand square meters of vegetable beds. Myself and one guy, we manage this in our spare time, and we're getting anywhere from, we're getting on average 200 rupees the kilo, so two euros the kilo, give or two dollars the kilo, give or take. So we're showing people that by doing small, you can return a profit out of it mm -hmm. while still maintaining your other jobs as well. Like in our case, we're also building, we're also doing water projects, we're also planting trees, we're also grafting trees, we're also running nursery. So like our vegetable production has really become like a side thing that we do. And yeah. I was thinking, uh, okay, if we want to go back to agrarian, to a proud agrarian, to a very hip agrarian, something that uh, can be once again attractive. Of course, everybody wants to get rich off of everything. We're quite exploitive, and that's okay. Um, absolutely okay. Um, but the other aspect of it is that uh, do we keep separating each other into social striation by having what you just described, which is absolutely stellar farming, using all the right techniques and whatnot. But do you see that price, which is a premium price, not everybody can pay, especially in the West, you got people on welfare. Here comes the catch-22. Yeah, here comes the catch-22. What, what do you now think? We, have, we ourselves have driven cheap vegetables to become the norm because right. we require it. We don't have enough money to it. To to enjoy a five dollar kilo of tomato. No, because people have rent, people have mortgages, people have petrol to put in the car, and of course to take care of their own kids well, you know. Uh, so what I think, especially for the Nepali context, let's say, where everybody is a landowner, and what is happening now is nobody is a farmer. Uh, the outward migration from village is happening. And what people are doing is they're using their land only as collateral, you know. So, and like this we end up uh, disengaging ourselves from our own environment because our, our land is not being worked anymore. We don't look at it as a value other than anything as collateral. Uh, so, and then eventually when you get your job as a doctor in the hospital, you're never coming home again. So you've actually become dis disengaged from your own roots. You know, so this is why personally I love the idea of promoting orchards that you can still plant your land, you can get something high value out of it, and at the end of the day, you only need to come back twice a year, really, 
one time to harvest and one time in winter to clean it up and in between you do your maintenance around like composting and blah 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 at the same time you you, you have a reason to come home to your village regularly and to connect with your families or your distant cousins or you know the community where you raised up and when you bring your kids your kids will also still maintain and on top of that every year you get a cash boom you know as well as your paycheck of being a doctor or an engineer or a farm worker you also get extra cash every year yeah you know and you're still left with something highly respectable to hand down to the next we are discussing a little of the uh, socio-economic in the farming where you were talking about the roots, uh, getting your roots back and then being in, in a position in your community that is uh, more present, uh, more valuable, and uh, you're, you're more of a foundation as opposed to just being a city dweller that comes and goes every few years and they don't even know you anymore or something like that. Uh, well, isn't it that the only true value that's left in the world is land? Like uh, salaries come and go, as we've come to see now. In the, and, in jobs. and jobs. <laughs> and in the end, if we're all just renters, what what's left to hand down? Like, for example, back home in Ireland, we, we have no land. I grew up renting houses. My mother rents a house. In the end, like there, there's nothing tangible to hand down to the next generation, which is a great sadness. Hmm. Uh, Whereas in Nepal, we still very much have this uh, land has a value mentality here. Uh, but you can already see the Western influences coming in that, I ah, just use the land for the bank, put it as the collateral, take the loan, buy the car, send the kids to college, no, 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 you know, like you use the land onto a next thing that actually has no guarantee. There's nothing guaranteed that you're going to get a degree as an engineer that you will actually have a job in 10 years time. But at least with land, you always have a guarantee, you know, and I think the powers that be understand that and that's why they're trying to ca- capture up everything. This is why they're happy to let you uh, have a loan with bank on uh, with land as the collateral, because the bank will always win in the end. Eh? So that's curious. So the, the government's actually um, uh, wanting this, is kind of actually pushing the idea of loss of land. Yeah. What do you think? they're going to do with it or what would be the result of I don't know why do the banks all want to have the gold you know I suppose that's the inherent uh, nature of greed is the possessiveness of it all you know (laughs) they want all the gold and they want all the land and they want all the how to say all the medical factories and all the markets you know the individuals with an ability to have a rights and a freedoms is I feel not not very welcome in the world. Uh, I see. This is a very good point, and and uh, I mean, I've got people from what a hundred and forty three hundred and forty five countries that that watch these, hopefully. Um, but of course uh, yeah, this is a very good point you're making. You know, this is Nepal, some little like little backwater tucked off in the middle of nowhere between two giant countries. It really has no international. Uh, signature or presence or, or power to speak of. It's a size of the state of Tennessee with a whole bunch of absolutely unbelievable nature going on in the Himala- Himalaya region and the jungles. Yet, um, as far as the human world is concerned, what goes on here is exactly the same which goes on all over the world. It's not just your country. Um, they, maybe they get it at a smaller scale. Mm. But what Charlie's describing, what Charlie witnesses from being a resident, from being a legitimate business owner here, you see a bit of the Gargal uh, 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 residencies going on up the hill there, which part of that slid down here in the latest rains we had. Uh, yeah, they're uh, being systematically, maybe, or maybe not systematically, but they find it's attractive to now leave home, leave the land, leave all this um, empty, uh, loses its value because all the farmers go away. It's it's a snowball, isn't it? I mean, after a while... All this land that you see here, all the way up back as far as I can see, is now come back to some point of jungle. But before, that was all farmed land. Everything you see around you was farmed land because the, how to say, the, the physical mass 
of people was here to work it. Right. And if nobody's here to work it, then there, there's no. This is what happens. Right. And like I said before, Charlie's got uh, at least two more stretches of land which are equally as lovely as this one, uh, going off towards the the valley there. And there's more yet to come and uh, more to see. Uh, did they have it going all the way up the hill here oh, that yeah, you know? Man, all the way up to the top, <laughs> all the way to the back. There is no limit of in terms of uh, of inclination that the, the the Nepali will stop to. I think they will plant on sheer cliff, hang things if they have to. They'll still plant. <laughs>